Hello, I'm uh, Mike Boninger, and I am a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and we'll uh, start this talk on the neuroscience-based approach to restoration of sensory motor function after spinal cord injury. Uh, presenting with me uh, will be uh, Rob Gaunt and Jen Collinger. Uh, my role is as one of the lead physicians on the study, and so I will start by talking about spinal cord injury itself. So a definition of spinal cord injury is a uh, lesion of the neural elements uh, in the spinal canal. Uh, so not only does that include the spinal cord, but also the cauda equina, resulting in a temporary or permanent sensory and or motor deficit. Uh, you can see the incidence here uh, of 17,000 uh, patients approximately per year. Um, the prevalence is all those people living with the spinal cord injury uh, and you can also see the injury level, and we'll talk a little bit more about the injury level as we go on. Uh, one of the important factors that we'll touch on also is the average age of participants. The average age is 42, but this is really a bimodal distribution in terms of age, in that uh, there is usually a young group, uh, which are risk-taking males in their 18 to 20-year-old uh, range, 16 to 20, and then there is an older group that's related to falls. If we talk about the impact of a spinal cord injury, it really depends on the level and the completeness of the injury. So the spinal cord travels in this bony structure that you can see on the slide. Uh, at a very high level, uh, C4 is one that's depicted here. You can, uh, a person can uh, lose their ability to breathe potentially, not be able to move their arms or hands at all, uh, and therefore have a complete paralysis. Uh, lower down injury may give partial use of the arms uh, and, and hands. Uh, and uh, if you have any impairment or your arms or hands, it's referred to as tetraplegia or quadriplegia. Uh, injuries below that level, uh, so uh, below uh, T1 in general, are considered to be paraplegia, meaning that the arms function normally. Uh, one can imagine that if you have uh, um, complete loss of your ability to move your arms, hands, and legs, uh, that uh, your, uh, it, your complete inability to really control your environment except for uh, using uh, the um, cranial nerve musculature, which enables you to talk and speak, uh, but you can't manipulate objects, you can't move objects around. Um, with a level of injury uh, below the, the point where the hand is affected, uh, one can live a very independent life, including um, uh, bowel and bladder function, um, uh, but usually that life is led from a wheelchair. And again, many spinal cord injuries are incomplete. And depending on how complete the injury is, how much strength and sensation there is below the level of injury will determine how much independence someone has. Important as we look at this, and, and part of the reason we're, I'm framing the question this way is related to cost, and we'll actually talk directly upon cost. And you can think of cost in dollars, which I will uh, give to you, but there's also a, a cost in quality of life. Uh, so the long-term survival in spinal cord injury is, it is shorter than that of uh, a population without a spinal cord injury, uh, but still fairly long. Uh, as you can see in this table, um, uh, if you're injured at age 20, um, and, and survive uh, uh, past the first year that your life expectancy, you're expected to live uh, approximately 52 years uh, longer um, or, uh, uh, and that, uh, you know, that's a substantial amount of life with what can be a significant disability. That life expectancy goes down over time. Um, and, and while I'm thinking that I should point out that most of these slides and most of this data is um, uh, from the National Spinal Cord Injury uh, Data Center, which is a project that is funded by the National Institutes of Disability and Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, NIDLR, uh, which funds uh, uh, 14 centers of excellence that collect data on spinal cord injury and then follow people with spinal cord injury over time. The University of Pittsburgh has one of those centers, uh, but that data set is actually available to, for anyone to answer. The data set focuses on traumatic spinal cord injury, although the technology that we're going to discuss today actually can cover both uh, uh, um, traumatic and non-traumatic spinal cord injury, as might be seen um, in a condition like MS, which can uniquely impact the spinal cord, uh, 
uh, there are other conditions that can impact the spinal cord uh, and that would be amenable to uh, um, a brain computer interface. Um, what's, you know, one of the examples of the impact of a spinal cord injury is uh, how it impacts your ability to work or be a student. And you can see that um, primarily because of the age distribution, uh, only about 57% of people uh, who sustain a spinal cord injury are working when they have their spinal cord injury. And then another 15% are students. Uh, that retired uh, group is likely the group that we talk about that would have a fall as a cause for their injury. Uh, the most important part though is the chart at the bottom of the slide which shows that at injury we have that 58-57% employment rate, 15% students. But just one year after injury, the employment uh, rate goes down from 58% uh, to 12%. And really, while it recovers, it never gets anywhere close to the 58% level. Um, and, and again, also, as one ages, there's less likelihood of being a student. Uh, but what that means is that 10 years after a spinal cord injury, only about 33% of those people who are injured are either a student or employed. Uh, and that adds to the cost. If we go a step further than that and we actually look at lifetime cost, you can see that depending on the level of injury, which really talks about what type of medical care will be required, uh, that uh, for a high tetraplegia, the cost can be a million dollars. And again, this is um, over five years ago. So a million dollars in the first year and then uh, 200,000, almost $200,000 each year thereafter. Uh, and, and really that's where we're talking about this intervention being appropriate. So lifetime costs, as you can see, can exceed three to $4 million uh, relatively easily uh, for someone who's injur injured at 25 years old uh, and, and you know, not that much less for someone injured at 50 years old, uh, mainly because of uh, 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 changes in medical comorbidities that might exist in an older population. So it is a popular, it, it, you know, it is an injury that results in significant disability, significant cost in terms of medical care, and then significant cost in terms of quality of life. You can imagine that if you're dependent on people for uh, what you have to do every day, something as simple as drinking out of a cup of water uh, that, and have to ask for help with that, that that would actually impact your, your quality of life, your enjoyment and what you get to do, both from a work perspective and from a play perspective. I should mention that having said that, uh, um, you know, one of the things uh, from this research is that uh, often we have a difficult time uh, recruiting subjects into the studies that you're going to hear. Uh, and so two points about that. One of the reasons we have such a difficult time can be that uh, people with spinal cord injury can make a very good lives for themselves, even with high tetraplegia. Uh, so uh, uh, lawyers, uh, physicians, uh, including medical students who've gone to, to medical school with high spinal cord injury are out there. Uh, and so there can be a, a, a full life even with the spinal cord injury. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we in any way want to stop uh, uh, medical science and looking at ways we can make life with the spinal cord injury better. If you look at uh, priorities for functional recovery, um, and uh, there are um, uh, many different studies that have looked at this. Um, some variation by how you ask the question, but a very high priority across the board is returning arm and hand function for those people who have tetraplegia or impairment in arm and hand function. So if you ask them what they'd like to do, they would like to be able to have their hand help them do things over and over again during their course of their daily lives, uh, like those people without disability uh, take for granted. Uh, this is where the brain computer interface can uh, come in. Uh, the, 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 uh, the brain, um, uh, the cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that initiates uh, motor movement is intact in a spinal cord injury. What is heard is what's inside that spinal canal, uh, the spinal cord itself. So all of the thought process that goes into thinking, I want to reach for this cup of water, uh, um, I have an itch that I want to scratch, all of that, all of those signals should be something that we can tap into in the brain. And it's exactly that that is uh, uh, part of what we want to do. Also, and very importantly, I've been talking in terms of motor function, but the other thing that is impacted in, in most spinal cord injuries is your ability to feel. Uh, 
So not only can you not move your arms, but because the spinal cord injury disrupts sensory pathways, you can't feel when some someone touches you, you can't necessarily feel pain. Uh, and so another goal of a bi-directional brain computer interface is to be able to restore sensation. Uh, and, and so what you have here is a diagram. Um, you can see uh, that there is a brain on the left side of the screen. Um, the ideal scenario and one that really mimics the human body is that um, it, as the hand, as you see here being a robotic hand, is interacting with the ball, there are sensors in the hand. Those sensors follow that red path and stimulate the brain, thus uh, restoring a feeling of sensation in a participant's own hand as, they, uh, um, as the robot grips the ball. So the, the, the ball is gripped, uh, the sensors on the hand uh, uh, sense that, there's stimulation that make it, it feel as if uh, someone's own hand is touching something. And then based on that touch, uh, the brain says, hey, I need to grip this ball a little harder. I need to let go of the ball. And the, the brain computer interface is able to decode that signal and control the robotic hand. Um, so this is the basis of what we're trying to do uh, uh, with this study. In the absence of sensation, um, fine uh, motor control is really impossible. Uh, and, and much of the work that has been, been done to date in spinal cord injury has uh, uh, used visual feedback as the only sensory feedback, which is slow and obviously uh, for a dexterous movement, something where you'd move your fingers to manipulate a fine object, um, your vision is obscured by the fingers themselves and sensation becomes uh, very important. Just uh, taking a step back, you're gonna hear about some great work that we've done here. Um, this is uh, truly a, a team effort um, and that team effort uh, crosses many different lines. Um, there is a clinical line, and so there have been um, uh, two, two physicians, myself included, very in, um, involved in the study. The other physician is Elizabeth Tyler Cabarro, who's a neurosurgeon here. Um, and uh, the two of us have uh, been responsible, the whole team is responsible for the health and safety of the participant, uh, but the two of us are, take the lead, and when there's medical questions, were involved. Uh, Elizabeth obviously does the surgery, uh, uh, and and I follow more of the day-to-day -day, uh, um, issues that may came up, come up. But it's a team of us that that, that are uh, helping to take care of our participants. Um, we have clinical coordinators who help us with recruiting uh, uh, participants. And again, um, if you are interested in being in this study, uh, there will be ways to find us on the web. I'd encourage you to do so. Um, these coordinators make sure that we're following the rules that uh, assure the protection of a subject. Uh, they uh, uh, help us with uh, the data gathering that we need to do as part of the different bodies that organize this. So this study is approved by the Food and Drug Administration, and there's very clear data collection that we have to follow to make sure that uh, subject safety is, uh, is assured as part of what we do. Uh, and then we've brought other physicians in along the way. There's an anesthesiologist that is there when we uh, um, implant and explant the subjects when we put the devices in. Um, and we've involved uh, plastic surgeons in the study as well. Uh, and basically the whole team at the University of Pittsburgh is here for us as uh, we need their help. Uh, I, a huge component of this um, and, and arguably the largest component from a pure discipline perspective is in engineering or bioengineering. Uh, so uh, the hardware and software, both of the robotic arms of the recording devices, of the stimulated devices, all have to be synced together with the software program. We have to uh, process the signals so that we understand what the person's intent is when they try to move. Uh, and then uh, we generate a, a huge amount of data with every single uh, day of experimentation that we have. And that huge amount of data uh, uh, really uh, requires that we have uh, the ability to store it um, in a secure fashion. Uh, this crosses both the clinical and engineering across a number of different sciences, uh, motor control, neural decoding, um, somatosensation, neurophysiology, and, and actually you could go on and on related to mathematical sciences uh, that are necessary. Uh, finally, uh, a huge component of this is regulatory um, we are appropriately monitored, monitored by the FDA. Uh, we are also monitored by the University of Pittsburgh Institutional Review Board, which assures protection of human subjects here at the university. 
Uh, and then further, because of the fact that this study is uh, one that uh, um, uh, has potential um, for uh, adverse effects, there is an independent data safety monitoring board that includes physicians and engineers uh, and other people working in this area that have uh, no reporting up to the people who are involved in the study are very independent and further look at the safety of what we're doing and any plans or change uh, any changes in plans we we, we uh, want to uh, have happen as part of our uh, protocol. Um, and then finally, um, uh, there's been a great deal of media attention. There's a fist bump shown here. Uh, where the, um, the robotic fist is controlled by our participant and the hand is uh, that of uh, the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, and, and we've had uh, significant attention. And so even the media people we work with are attuned to the study uh, and, and help us uh, with uh, getting our message across and making sure that we're uh, adequately representing what we do. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over uh, to Rob Gaunt who is uh, also faculty at the University of Pittsburgh and uh, uh, one of the uh, lead, uh, the two leads of the study together with uh, Jen Collinger. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so what I'm gonna do over the next little while is tell you about some of the basic science that goes into actually being able to achieve this goal that Mike described uh, about creating a bi-directional brain computer interface. And so I'll treat two different parts separately um, and then my colleague, uh, Jen Collinger, will come in at the end uh, and show you what we're able to do when we put it all together. All right, so let's get into this. Uh, there's basically two components that we need to be able to accomplish in order to create this bi-directional uh, brain-computer interface. One um, is how do we read information out of the brain? How do we extract information from the brain that we could use to then control an arm? And the second part um, how does, is how do we actually get that information uh, back in? So I'll treat these two points uh, separately. So when we think about reading information from the brain or extracting information from the brain, really what we're after is a way to listen to the cells or the neurons in our brain that are allowing us to normally control our arms. So when we think about reaching for objects or moving around, there's a particular part of our brain that becomes active. The cells, the neurons in that part of the brain become active. Um, and effectively control the arm. Now, there's a few different ways that these signals can be extracted uh, from the brain. They range in, in invasiveness um, from uh, superficial or external systems, like I'm showing here on the left, the so-called EEG. Um, and in this sort of a scenario, uh, you can wear a cap or put a device on the head and monitor the electrical activity of these cells um, as they become active completely externally. It's a nice approach because it uh, requires no surgery. It's external. The challenge with it um, is that it's very low resolution, and it's, it's very difficult to actually really listen to the signals that you want to be able to capture about arm and hand function. Uh, there's sort of intermediate levels uh, where we can uh, do a surgery and place uh, electrodes on the surface of the brain. Um, it's sort of an intermediate step. But what we do is actually uh, shown on the right here. Uh, where we in, take these devices, these microelectrode arrays, which I'll describe in a little more detail on the next slide, and actually uh, do a surgery and implant these right into the brain itself. All right, so let's look at these arrays in a little more detail. And so the device we use is the Utah or BlackRock microelectrode array. And what this is, it's a silicon-based device. Um, each edge of this device is about four millimeters on a side. So you can see an image of it there on a fingernail to give you a sense of how big this device is. Uh, what's impressive about it is that within this device, that single little device there, there's actually 100 individual little needles or electrodes. And right at the very tip of those is uh, an area that sits down in the brain right beside uh, individual neurons in the brain. And when we hook the whole system up, and I'll show you some examples of this, we can actually listen to or record the electrical activity of individual neurons in the brain. So these divide, these, each individual electrode is about one and a half millimeters long. Uh, we coat them with different materials depending on what we want to do. If we're listening to the brain uh, to recording, if we're thinking about read, we're mostly using platinum electrodes right now. Uh, but we can use a different material, iridium oxide, when we want to actually activate the brain or stimulate the brain and, and write information in. Um, these devices have been implanted uh, in over 20 people uh, around the world. And so two of those have occurred here at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we'll get into their stories uh, a little bit and what we've done uh, on the scientific side with them. 
Okay, so this is the device we use. Um, now, when we think about where actually in the brain uh, do we want to put these devices, uh, that becomes an important question or an important problem. Not all parts of the brain are the same. Different parts of the brain have specialized functions for different sorts of behaviors. Um, and the two that we're most interested in are, are shown here. So I'm showing you in the red a region that we call the somatosensory, or that is called the somatosensory cortex. Um, and just ahead of it, a little closer towards the front of the head of the eyes, uh, is a region called the motor cortex. Now, these two regions have very different functions, although they're uh, related to each other significantly. And we'll get into that in a little bit. But in the motor cortex, there's neurons that when you think about moving your arm, you actually move your arm, uh, these neurons become active, okay? Um, in the somatosensory cortex, this is the part of the brain that if you touch your hand, or frankly, any part of your body, neurons here respond in different ways depending on what part of the body has been touched. Um, and particularly in the somatosensory cortex, uh, we, we have this uh, somatotopic arrangement or this sort of image or picture of our whole body right in the brain. And that's what's shown on the right. This is often uh, called the homunculus, and what, which means little man. And what we see here um, is different parts of the brain, even within the somatosensory cortex, do different things. And so there's a spot to go. There's a particular part of the brain that becomes active when, say, your elbow is touched, a different part that becomes active when your palm or your thumb or your, each individual finger is touched, and so on and so forth. And so we can actually identify where these are and put our devices, our microelectrode arrays, in the right spot. Okay, so this is the part of the brain that we're going to. Now let's put it all together and take a look at what happens when we stick these electrodes in the brain. And we'll focus here on putting, say, two devices, two of these Utah or BlackRock microelectrode arrays into the motor cortex. If we put these devices in there and then we actually ask a person to imagine or attempt to make movements, um, what we see is all these little squiggles here. So each one of these little black squares represents one of those electrodes in the brain and the little gray lines represent uh, the electrical activity uh, when an action potential is fired by one of the neurons. We see a, a zoomed in view of one here and we can see that this particular electrode is actually recording two different neurons, the one here labeled in orange and another in blue. And so this is fundamentally the signal that we're working with. Each one of these little squiggles or traces represents a single neuron in the brain activating or firing or generating action potential when we think about a movement. So this is what we're working with. And the question next, obvious one is, what do we do with this information? And so I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of the detail on how we interpret these signals, which we can then use to control a robotic arm. And so what we, uh, what we work with or what we think about is this idea of directional tuning in motor cortex. And so this was uh, some thoughts that were uh, popularized or really discovered by George Opolis, um, and, and uh, Andy Schwartz. Andy Schwartz is a faculty member here at the University of Pittsburgh uh, who did a lot of the basic science work to figure this thing out. And I'll describe this uh, basic idea in, in this slide here, right? And so if we have a monkey uh, sitting down at a table and moving his arm to the left or right or up and down, and we record the activity of a single neuron in the brain, what they found is that you can see really uh, substantial differences in the behavior or the activity of that single neuron when you make reaches in different directions. So if we move to the middle panel here and look at this blue, uh, this blue region, what you'll see is that if you look sort of in the upper left-hand side in the orange region, you'll see all these little black tick marks. Every one of those little vertical marks or slashes represents a single neuron generating one of these action potentials. And you can see that when the monkey's making a reach sort of up into the left, there's a lot of these marks, right? So this neuron becomes very, very active. Um, and in the opposite direction, if we look sort of down into the right, uh, well, we hardly see any of these marks, they're mostly gone. And so what this particular neuron is doing is becoming really active when the monkey reaches up into the left. And it becomes almost silent or quiet when you move down into the right. And so you can create a, a mathematical relationship that describes um, how the monkey's moving his arm and then relate that to the activity of this individual neuron. And in this case, what that looks like uh, is this small equation down here um, where F represents the firing rate or activity of a neuron. And basically this is a weighted sum or a combination of the activity um, that's driven by movements in different directions. And so 
the firing rate uh, is driven by, um, or we model it this way, at least the firing rate is a function of the velocities of the arm in the X and Y direction. Okay. This might be, I think we'll see one more equation that might be it for equations for this talk. But then we can, we can expand this idea um, and add as many things as we want, right? So if the monkey's uh, just reaching on a, on a table like this, now you can imagine rotating the wrist or making grasping motions, and we can follow the same basic idea that the firing rate of a neuron is effectively the weighted sum of, the, um, of all of these different motions. And so if we record from a lot of neurons at the same time, what we can do is then create a decoder that turns all of that activity um, into what we believe the intention of the movement was, right? So the neural activity is really modeled as this weighted sum of the movement intentions, okay? So that's kind of the math behind this a little bit. And you can just really think of this as when you move in a particular direction, certain neurons become highly active. And we can pick that up and then recreate those motions. All right, so we've got these arrays in the brain. We can understand what they're saying. And now what we need to do is actually figure out what all the elements of those individual equations were. And that's what we do um, in this BCI calibration step. And effectively what we do, if a person comes into the lab, they sit down, we hook them up, and they watch on a, on a computer screen uh, a virtual robotic arm making a bunch of motions. And we basically create a series of random motions. You can move up to the left, then we can rotate the wrist, open or close the hand, and sometimes there will be objects there. And we create sort of a new set of these random motions each day, and we ask the person to follow along and attempt to make those motions. Now, they can't, of course, because of the spinal cord injury, but nevertheless, the key point here is that even attempting to do it or thinking about doing it, even if your own arm doesn't move, still generates the same pattern of activity or at least a similar pattern of activity in the brain, one that we can understand. And so this is the calibration step um, that we do every day. Okay, now we've worked with two people in this study uh, to date. Uh, the first subject was a 52-year-old woman at the time of implant who had a spinal cerebellar degeneration, which left her uh, effectively paralyzed below the neck. And she had two devices implanted in the motor cortex. The second participant uh, was a 28-year-old man at the time of implant uh, as, with a spinal cord injury. Um, he actually had four devices implanted in his brain, two in the motor cortex and two in the somatosensory cortex. And uh, what, I'm sh what you'll see here um, in a video in a moment uh, will be, if we put all of these pieces together, you'll see a video of this second participant uh, controlling a robot arm by thinking about making motions. What he'll be doing is he'll be reaching down uh, to these objects that are placed on the left-hand side of the table, picking them up and moving them to this raised platform. And there's a couple of really important points here, is that every aspect of this robot is controlled only by him thinking about it. He could do anything he wants, but what he's choosing to do is do this task that we've asked him to do. So the computer's not really helping at all. They're just interpreting the activity of his brain to control the, uh, to control the robot. You'll see an example of that I um, mean, one of the objects where he reaches down to pick up a rock, but the rock actually slips out of his grasp. He recovers and goes and picks it up again and successfully completes the task. Uh, so we can go ahead and play that video and you can take a look at it. And so in that video, you can see the robot arm moving around. And this is what we call the action research. It's a version of something called the action research arm test, the ARAT score. And we, so we basically measure how well he does. And in these two participants, if we look at their performance at completing this task um, over a long time, you can see on this graph here on the x-axis is the number of days post-implant. We're going out to nearly 1,000 days um, that their performance is actually very good. Um, and as maintained over these long periods of time. And so what this shows us is that
using this brain-computer interface system, people are able to control ro robot arms to complete functional, sort of meaningful, real-world tasks and uh, do a pretty good job of it, right? So, so we've talked now about the reading question. How do we extract the information from the brain in order to control the robot arm? So let's talk about the second half of this, which is getting information uh, back into the brain. And so uh, what we'll talk about here is sort of this case for somatosensation. And by somatosensation, I mean the sense of touch and motion and things like that. So what I've just shown you um, is that we can control these dexterous prosthetic arms, that we can control them uh, to do many motions at the same time. Um, but an important point here is the person was looking at it all the time. But there's all sorts of tasks we do in our daily lives where vision is not the only thing uh, that we're using, and in fact, where it becomes insufficient. And I've shown some examples of this. If you want to touch your fingers to each other on the top of your head, uh, you can't see it. So you need a way to be able to do that. Another example would be buttoning shirt buttons. Um, this is the sort of task that you really need high quality tactile feedback from your fingertips in order to complete. Or if you're grabbing, say, a Nerf ball and you want to see how hard or soft it is. Um, these are the sorts of things where somatosensation uh, is really important. A sort of a, a stunning example of this really in some ways is shown in these two uh, images here where on the left, the person grabbed a match, really easy task, pick a match out of the box and light it. And that's sort of the normal scenario. On the right though, where you can see her struggling with this task, the only thing that is different um, is that she's had uh, the, the fingertips have essentially been anesthetized, and so she cannot feel the objects. And you can see her really struggling to pick up these objects. After enough time, she does get it. But this sort of illustrates the challenges involved um, in trying to do daily tasks if you cannot actually feel the objects you're trying to work with. And so what we've done is to try and fix this or to address this issue is we want to restore and generate these sensations. The way we do that is by electrical stimulation of the brain. And so we take these same devices and rather than recording the activity of individual neurons, what we're trying to do is electrically stimulate them. And the idea here, the concept, is that if we force these neurons to become active, that the person will experience this as the sensation of touch. So if we stimulate the right neurons, we can make, we can sort of create the sensation of touch. And that's in fact what we did. And so in this particular uh, person, what we found is that when we electrically stimulate on individual uh, electrodes, that generates a sensation that feels like it comes from his own paralyzed hand. And so what you can see sort of in the middle here um, is the representation of two of these smaller electrode arrays in the brain and where you see a color, say an orange square, that's one of those individual electrode tips that I showed you earlier on the Utah array. And when we electrically stimulate with small currents through that device or through that individual electrode, it generates a sensation on the similarly colored part of his hand. So you can see with these two devices, we generated sensations um, that he described, that the participant described as coming from uh, his own hand, uh, according to the map that I'm showing he you here. And this is work that was really uh, largely done by Charlene Flesher, uh, who's a former graduate student uh, in the lab. An interesting thing here is that if we look at where these sensations are coming from, it follows this arrangement that we would expect to be present in the brain. And this is even after a decade uh, after the spinal cord injury. And so this somatotopic organization is persistent in the brain even after a decade, and we can use that or leverage that um, for the purposes of this device. Um, by the way, this was the first time that this kind of a study had ever been done in a person before. And one of the questions we were really interested in uh, was how stable would this be over time? It was, you know, it was uncertain whether microstimulation in the brain would be able, would work for a long time. And so what this slide shows here is that over the course of 1,200 days as we've been stimulating, and even in fact longer now, that the organization in the brain remains the same. We're able to use it. And roughly speaking, it's, it, uh, it doesn't change. And so 1,200 days after the implant, it still was working. And you could even argue that it's working better than it was um, over the first few hundred days of the study. So again, each little color dot represents when we stimulate on an individual electrode, what part of the hand does the person describe a sensation as originating from? I'll spend a couple of moments talking about some of the details of this uh, before I pass it off to Jen to, to put it all together for us here at the end. Uh, one of the important questions is we wanted to know 
uh, effectively what the detection threshold is. So as I, as I mentioned before, we're using tiny pulses of electricity to activate these neurons. And a, and a relevant question is how much current, how much uh, stimulation current do we need to actually cause a sensation? And so this is what we call the detection threshold. And so we can do some tests to measure this. And what I'm showing you on the left here is if we look at all um, the detection thresholds from all of the electrodes, about 100 days after we did the implant, you can see that the median detection threshold is about 32 microamps. So that's 32 millionths of an amp. Um, what's really interesting is after 500 days, when we repeated this, um, the detection threshold had gone down to about 14 microamps. And so we are able to use less current to generate these sensations as time goes on. So that's a really positive and encouraging sign for sort of the utility um, of this kind of a device or interface in the long term. Another thing we found is that when we turn the stimulation amplitude up, we wanted to know what happens. And what we're showing here is that if we turn the stimulation amplitude up, we start low and then we go high and we ask the person to say, what do you feel? What does it feel like? Um, in fact, how intense is it? What we see is a linear relationship between the intensity of the, his perception of the stimulus and the current amplitude. And so what that means is that um, we know now that if we stimulate on this electrode or that electrode, we can cause sensations in different parts of the hand. If we turn the stimulation amplitude up, that feeling, whatever he is feeling, feels more intense. And so we can manipulate the location and the intensity um, of percepts that he feels come from his hand. Uh, one, of the la one of the last things I'll show you here um, is sort of a relative, is an important question, but what does it actually feel like? We want to know what electrical stimulation in the brain actually feels like. And this is actually quite a difficult question to ask. Well, in fact, it's easy to ask, but difficult to get a meaningful answer to it. And so what I'm showing you here is, uh, you know, after about a year into the study, we looked at what was he telling us the most. And a lot of the electrodes felt like pressure, some like tingle, some electric, some warm. Um, and they feel possibly natural. He's not entirely sure. He's not co confident that it feels totally natural or totally unnatural. And so we're trying to figure out um, how to actually create stimulation patterns that do feel more natural. And that's an ongoing research problem. So a couple of important things, though, are that it's never painful. Um, and that if any of you have ever had electrical stimulation done on you, say you've been to the physiotherapist or something, and you've had electrical stimulation of your own skin, you know what that feels like. And it feels, well, you'd probably say electrical. Um, an important thing here is that whatever we're doing in the brain, it doesn't really feel like that. It feels very different. In fact, he describes it as feeling very different um, than that sort of surface stimulation. And if we pattern this electrical stimulation in ways that we try to represent, say, being tapped on the finger um, he actually says those sorts of things, that short bursts of stimulation feel like tapping. So to bring this back together for a second, we've shown you that we can extract information from the brain by listening to the activity of neurons in the motor cortex to control a robot arm, that, and that when we electrically stimulate in the somatosensory cortex, we can create these percepts, these sensations that he feels like come from his own paralyzed hand, and we can manipulate the location, intensity, and to some degree, the quality of those sensations itself. So we've got those two individual parts, and now my colleague, Jen Collinger, who's a, a, a prof an assistant professor with me here in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehab at uh, the University of Pittsburgh, will put it all together for us and see what happens when we, uh, when we do it all together. Okay, thanks, Rob. And so as uh, my colleagues have been alluding to, I'm gonna tell you what happens when we try to put these two things together, the motor BCI with the somatosensory feedback. And I know that we've talked a lot about why do we think we need somatosensation. And a lot of the examples that have been shown have been these more dexterous tasks like tying shoelaces or buttoning a button. But there's a whole other class of tasks that actually require somatosensation that you might not think of. You know, for example, holding a cup, um, applying the same force for a long period of time, that requires tactile and proprioceptive feedback. When you pass an object to another person, even though you have visual feedback of that task, you really rely on your somatosensory feedback to execute the timing of that task well. Same thing for picking up fragile objects. And this is really where we wanted to start with our um, bidirectional BCI control. And so I'll talk you through a little bit of that experiment now. And so I should mention, I think Rob's already highlighted Charlene Flesher um, as being sort of the leader of, of some of these experiments with significant input from John Downey and Jeff Weiss, former grad students in the lab as well. 
And so Mike introduced um, the scheme of the bidirectional VCI at the beginning of the experiment, but just to reiterate here, we've got our participant who's seated in their power wheelchair looking at the robotic arm that's positioned off to the side. We're recording um, activity from the motor cortex and decoding that to control the endpoint velocity of the arm. Here, what we're gonna show is three-dimensional movements and space of the arm, as well as orientation of the wrist. Um, and opening and closing the hand. And so all of that will be under continuous and simultaneous control by the participant. At the same time, we're recording from the torque sensors in the robotic arm, and we are transforming that into stimulation uh, uh, patterns for electrodes that are implanted into somatosensory cortex. So as they squeeze an object harder, the amount of uh, stimulation amplitude or the intensity of that stimulation will increase during the experiment. The first question that we asked was, can ICMS or intracortical microstimulation improve object transfers. So the task is very simple. They have a horizontal workspace in front of them that's shown here in the gray, the red, and the green. An object is positioned on the left-hand side of the workspace in what we call the grasp zone. They need to move the robot to the left, pick it up, lift it over the transport zone, and set it down in the release zone. And then the experimenter quickly moves it back to the grasp zone, and they try to do that as many times as they can in two minutes. And so the way that we structured this experiment was first we did four days of this task with ICMS and then four days without. And importantly, the participant had been doing this type of task for more than two years um, you know, with visual feedback primarily um, throughout the experiment prior to these studies. We did um, five trials of this task per day, each of them lasting two minutes. And again, the goal is just to complete as many object transfers as possible within those two minutes. And it turns out that um, ICMS did improve performance on this task. So without stimulation across all of those trials, he was able to complete 315 transfers as compared to 352 with stimulation. And so if you break that down into the, the two minute long trial, without stimulation, that's 15.8 transfers and with stimulation, 17.8, um, which reduced the, the time per transfer by about a second. And so to give you a sense of what this looks like, what I'm showing you here is um, sort of that horizontal workspace again, but now we're looking at a heat map where the intensity of that color is telling you on average for a trial, how long did the participants spend with the robotic arm in a particular area of the workspace? So if we look at the graph on the left first um, where he was performing the task without ICMS. You can see in the grasp zone, you know, there's this center of activity shown in yellow around where the object was. And remember the task is to pick it up, move it through the transport zone and release it. And so you see that there's a lot of time spent hovering on the left side of the workspace near the grasp zone, particularly when you compare it to the right, the figure on the right, where there's never um, quite that intense um, yellow that you see on the left, meaning that he didn't spend as much time in that grasp zone. You might also notice that there's more variability in the area of the workspace that he explored without ICMS. And so we can quantify this. Um, if you look at the amount of time that he spent in each of these zones that I've defined, the biggest improvement by far was seen in the grasp zone. So he was able to decrease the amount of time that he spent in the grasp zone by about a second, which is, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's really a 30% decrease in the amount of time that he was spending trying to grasp that object. There was no significant difference in the amount of time it took him to transport the object across the workspace. But then in the release, um, we also saw a slight decrease of about a half a second or 18% in that release zone as well. And so we wanted to know what actually caused the reduction in that time that was spent in the grasp zone. And so we quantified the distance that the arm was traveling within that, that grasp zone uh, prior to object contact. And when he had stimulation, you can see there in the blue histograms, this is showing the number of trials for a given path length. The blue trials tend to cluster on the left-hand side, meaning that he was traveling less of a distance in that grasp zone than without stimulation, which is shown in gray. And so overall, he was moving about 12 centimeters less uh, per transfer when he had stimulation. And so again, this means that when he was approaching the object, rather than trying to reposition the hand for an appropriate grasp, um, he was able to quickly grasp the object and move to the transfer phase. And Rob briefly introduced the, the action research arm test, which we've used a lot in our studies. Um, it's commonly used to evaluate motor performance after a stroke because it measures unilateral arm function. And so here for these experiments, we tested nine of the 19 possible tasks. So the goal is to pick up uh, four different size cubes, a sphere, a rock, two different size cylinders, and also to perform a water pouring task. But you can see in the picture on the right, essentially the object is placed in the left-hand side of the workspace. The user moves the robot arm to the object, grasps it, picks it up, and move, puts it on a raised platform. 
And for the scoring, um, they attempted each object on a given day three times. The best of those attempts was scored from zero to three, where a score of zero means that they were unable to complete any movement, which that score never occurred. One, that the task was partially completed, able to touch the object. Two is that they were able to complete that grasp, transport, and release in somewhere less than two minutes. And then three means that they completed that task in less than five seconds. So five seconds is what's considered a normal completion time um, for an able-bodied person. We did tell the participant that their completion times would be recorded for all of the trials to calculate an overall success rate and completion uh, time per trial. And so again, on this task, um, we saw improved performance with stimulation. And so what I'm showing you here in this graph, first, um, I'm showing you the scores that the participant was able to achieve really over the two years prior to these experiments, where most of these experiments were done without uh, somatosensory feedback, as shown in gray. A few times we did try um, providing sensory feedback shown in blue with different settings than what were, were tested here, usually a single channel of, of stimulation. But what you see is that when we moved to um, the ICMS experiments shown in the middle column here, the score improved over all of um, the scores that he had achieved over the past two years. And then when we took that away for the final four sessions, it returned back down to uh, the baseline level. And so to give you an idea of what these scores mean, you know. His prior performance, the median score was an 18, which based on our scoring scheme, you know, typically would be achieved by completing all of the tasks successfully, but in under two minutes, because we have nine tasks, each of them were scored at two. With ICMS, the score was a 21, which means that he was able to perform some of those tasks, at least three of them, um, in under five seconds, which is considered a normal able-bodied time. And again, after removing ICMS for the last four sessions, the scores went back down to the baseline level. So again, if we look at um, how long did it take him to complete these tasks, here I'm showing you a histogram of the number of trials that he was able to complete within different time periods. And so without ICMS, the median completion time was 20.9 20 seconds out of all of the successful trials that were completed. But when we gave him uh, sensory feedback, you can see that the completion times are much lower because the histogram is shifted towards the left. And the median time there was 10.2 seconds. So we're able to cut the completion time for successful trials um, in half, essentially, even with this fairly simple encoding scheme. And importantly, 15 out of the 108 trials that he attempted were completed in under five seconds, something that he had not achieved previously um, without ICMS feedback. So to break this down a little bit further, again, we looked at how did this actually impact the task um, in the different phases. And so the first phase is the reach phase, so starting from the home position and reaching to initially touch the object. We did see a little bit of a decrease here of 0.6 seconds, which was a 27% uh, decrease in that amount of time. The biggest change, just like in the object transfer task, really came from grasp. So that time from initially contacting the object to picking it up and starting to initiate that transfer. Um, and so here we saw that the, the median time decreased from 13.8 seconds to 5.8 seconds, which was a 44% reduction um, in time spent. In transport, there was a very slight reduction in the amount of time that was spent actually moving it over to the raised platform. So to give you a sense of what this looks like, um, after this, we'll play a video showing you for each of the different objects, what was the fastest trial that he was able to achieve with ICMS feedback shown on, left, on the left and without ICMS feedback shown on the right. And so what you see is just like the, the data we're showing, is that um, with ICMS feedback, he's much more confident in reaching towards and grasping the object and initiating that transfer over to the raised surface. Whereas without ICMS, often he's sort of taking extra time to position the hand to ensure that the grasp is gonna be successful. And so now we can play the video. Okay, and hopefully that video gave you a sense for you know, how ICMS feedback can actually improve performance. And so even though you know, Rob started out by showing you 
that you know, using this decoding scheme, we can achieve high performance with visual feedback. Really, what this study shows is that BCI control without somatosensory feedback is impaired. Right? And here I'm showing you, again, one example of, of how we quantified that in terms of a, a reduction in completion times when we added sensory feedback. But this lines up with what um, people have observed you know, in other cases where for, there's a neurologic condition that results in deafferentation or um, using sort of uh, surface anesthesia to, to anesthetize the digits, you know, where people are able to do tasks and ha able to perform movements without sensation just using vision, but they're impaired when you, when you take that away. And we think that ICMS of, of area one of somatosensory cortex, which is where these electrodes are implanted, is improving performance in a way that is congruent with natural continuous feedback. And there's a few different pieces of evidence for that. So first is that when we added this feedback, it improved performance you know, immediately, even though he'd been practicing this task for over two years, which seems that you know, it's not sensory substitution or something that needed to be learned. He was able to integrate that naturally and improve his, his motor control. And importantly, when we took it away, it also returned to baseline very quickly. You know, another way that we think that this um, shows that it's congruent is that really the improvement came from this increased certainty around grasping. So we spent less time trying to position the hand to grasp. And we know that somatosensory uh, feedback typically cues very strongly to these times of state transitions when you're going to initially contact or release an object. And so we saw improvements in those areas that sort of line up with what we know from the neuroscience of how um, somatosensory feedback improves motor control. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge our, our large team. Um, just three of us have been here talking today, but really there's a lot of work that goes on um, to this, thanking our students and postdocs, as well as our faculty collaborators. And of course, we could not do this work without our study participants who dedicate an extraordinary amount of time to helping us um, learn the neuroscience that goes into developing these devices to restore upper limb function. So thank you.